The next uh, paper will be by Professor Swartz. Uh, Professor Swartz really needs no introduction. Uh, he's an icon. Uh, we have a very, well, it, he is uh, at the Universidad San, pa San Pablo de Madrid. He's been professor of economics in three major universities. He's an LSE, MA, and PhD. Uh, his dissertation was on the work of John Stuart Mill at LSE. He studied under Lionel Robbins and Karl Popper. Although he did not study under Montesquieu, he has written widely on his work and is considered an expert in the history of economic thought. Uh, he was born to a family of diplomats. As you can see, he looks very much like, uh, like a, the man who would be negotiating a great treaty or uh, opening a, uh, uh, a country for economic development. But he had passed the exams to become a diplomat uh, in Spain, yet the Franco regime blocked his appointment to the diplomatic corps. Uh, although he, the career of a diplomat diplomacy and uh, economist has obvious overlaps. We're ha very happy that uh, he pursued economics. He's been a frequent uh, commentator on Spanish financial issues for the BBC and a regular contributor to ABC of Madrid, Expansion, and the Financial Times. He is uh, obviously a very busy man. Uh, he serves on the board of a, a lot of different uh, organizations, including the Cato Institute in Washington. And he's received way too many awards to, to mention, like uh, most of our other panel members. So uh, without any further uh, ado, and uh, just to re remind you that the full resume is, will be available on the uh, Society website, I am most pleased to introduce Professor Pedro Schwartz. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. I'm very happy to be speaking here today. Now, let me get the... Um, how do I get this on? Oh, he's coming, he's coming. They unplugged. No, no, pero esto es para... Okay. <laughs> no, that's not me. I wouldn't dare to take the place of Jesus Huerta. I don't have the energy <laughs> to sustain the fight that he's been he's been having over the last over the last year. And he's an inspiration to all of us. I'm going or I'm going to take with Juan Castañeda, who's there. We both written a paper to uh, uh, to look at facts and not. At desires. That is, we're going to we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about matters of fact and not. That's right. And okay. <clears throat> and, and not so much on what I would like the wor the world to look like. So we're going to discuss optimal monetary zones. Why there is no single money in the world. The problem is that we have two uh, economists who appear to be in some way against each other at loggerheads. One is Milton Friedman, who defended flexible exchange rates in a famous, pa famous paper I'm going to talk about now. And the other is Mandel, who presented the idea of a euro many, many years ago, and now is even speaking of a world currency. And so it seems that they are really apart. But the question is, if Milton Friedman's right, and flexible exchange rates are best, why aren't there flexible exchange rates within the United States? And if Mandel is right, and it's best to have a single currency, why don't we have a single currency? And this is what we're going to address, to see if we can describe the facts that explain why this problem exists. And, uh, and then we are going to try and have a number that tells us how far uh, a given zone is away from an optimal currency zone. So we are discussing positive and not normative analysis. <clears throat> now, the idea is that the first best, obviously, is to have a single currency. And we've heard about the gold standard because that reduces transaction costs. 
However, the single currency has uh, disadvantages if you have a rigid system of institutions. And therefore, imposing or having or deciding for a single currency would give you other costs. So it's a matter of choosing one or the other. And so, for many, the second best is that we have a mixture of many currencies among countries and one currency within country or within the European Union. <clears throat> now, if we look at uh, a coast, we take a Kosian point of view, what we're saying is that it seems that the institutional limitations make it different, difficult for the first best to be applied. But there may be the case that in time and with network effects, the idea of a single currency may, or the, uh, uh, the institution of single currency may be able to, be, uh, to exist in, in the world. <clears throat> now, Milton Friedman in 1953 um, presented as a basic idea, his basic idea was to achieve and maintain a free and prosperous world community engaging in unrestricted multilateral trade. Here we are underlining something, which is if you, if you have a single currency zone and you want that to work, there should be within unrestricted free trade, movement of people, movement of capital, and so on. <clears throat> so that's a condition for having, that even Milton Freeman presented, for having a single, uh, an optimal currency zone. <clears throat> but he said it's very difficult to have uh, wages fall and costs fall, so therefore we ought to say there should be, said Milton Friedman, there should be flexible exchange rate among or between countries. <clears throat> now, why internal prices are not flexible, uh, as flexible as exchange rates and wage rates are, tend to be um, between, among the less flexible prices and so on. So making prices decline is difficult, and so he said it's best to take the shortcut and have a flexible exchange rates among countries. <clears throat> now, he was for a mixed system, and just as Mandel, he accepted that, there's no objection to a mixed system, as he said. You have a flexible exchange system uh, among countries, but within countries, states have effectively, the states in the United States have effectively surrendered, surrendered the right to impose restrictions to movements of goods, people, and capital, and have a single currency. So the United States is much nearer to what Mandel would call an optimal currency zone than uh, Europe, for example. <clears throat> now, Mandel took the other side, and uh, he said, uh, he, in a paper in 1961, very famous one, he's a Canadian economist, and uh, he said, why should Canada have this? If you are for a, a flexible exchange rates, why should Canada have a single dollar, a Canadian dollar? No, you, you, need, you would need a dollar for the East and another dollar for the West because their structure of industry is different. And in fact, the same would happen with the US. So he said, it's ridiculous to ask for flexible exchange rates, because then where do you stop? Each company could have a flexible exchange rate of its own. <clears throat> so he again was uh, knew that uh, our system was mixed, and uh, and what he said is that the fixed exchange rate is better within areas where factors are mobile, and the flexible exchange rate system, uh, the uh, fixed exchange rate is better within areas, and the flexible exchange rate system is better where factors are immobile. Now, in 1969, that far, he presented the idea for a European currency, uh, Mandel did. And, uh, and in a way, the euro is his artifact. So uh, he, uh, he presented that then, and then uh, um, he, he also had a very different political point of view from Friedman. Friedman wanted flexible exchange rates so that you could have free trade free movement of capital and people. Mandel wanted single currencies, especially in a zone, so that the state would have in its hand, uh, even if it's a fixed exchange rate, would have a currency that increased its power. So mm, the, uh, uh, there's an inherent tendency for a common international mind to develop because of economic, economics of scale. That he had as a, as a seed for further thought, but uh, he went on to uh, European currency, presenting that in 69. Um, uh, the case for European money must be made primarily on political grounds, which is what happened. 
just because politics in the widest sense of the word override economics. What they've done with the euro, and Mandel wanted it, I've heard it from his lips, is yes, it's better to have a fixed exchange rate because of, of the discipline that it imposes, but also because it's a, an instrument to create a European state. And you mustn't forget, when we defend the euro, that it has this other dimension, that it may be an instrument for a European state. All right, he, in, now, now in 2013, he suddenly has changed. And he has said the flexible exchange rate expands a failure. Uh, an international monetary system would avoid changes in real exchange rates and not overshooting and so on. So his solution is to create an international currency that can be used by all countries for international trade purposes. And he even gives it a name in the tradition of Keynes, the INTOR. <clears throat> Anyhow, we see him moving from monetary zones to the world as a monetary zone. All right, let's go back to positive economics. These are the proposals of these two economists. They pose the problem that if fixed exchanges are so good, why don't we have one currency in the world? And if flexible exchange rates are so good, why don't we have many more currencies than we have? And this is what we want that, uh, um, that um, uh, we want to address. Now, what we've, uh, what we've done is a very simple model. We are still working on it. Uh, the idea is to, to minimize total costs of monetary arrangements. And those total costs of monetary arrangements depend on the following arguments. One, MJ, which is the number of currencies in a zone. So if you have many currencies, as Milton Friedman wanted, then you have a higher cost of a monetary arrangement because uh, you have these transaction costs. On the other hand, if you have a single currency and if you have uh, M sub J, which is the number of currencies in a zone, is one, then that has a trade-off. And the trade-off is that unless you change your institutions, and you may, but that's not our point today, you have, you have uh, the, uh, the increase in unemployment, uh, the increase in inflation, P sub Y, so by the growth, unit labor costs, uh, real exchange rate, the deficit, and the debt. So if you have one single currency, those other arguments pose a problem. <clears throat> and we've done it this way. We subject the previous, uh, this minimization problem, we subject it to uh, saying, A, that both sides are positive, that is, if uh, that the minimization and the F uh, work together, then what you have is the, the, what we are measuring is the dis dispersion of the other, the dispersion of the other elements here. You see, the S, the sigma two square is the dispersion in a monetary zone of unemployment, of growth, of total labor costs, and so on. We're going to show some graphs of that. And if there's a great deal of dispersion or variance, then it's much more difficult to have a single currency because you have costs. It may do something about those costs, but that's something that we observe. So what we have is the sigma square is the variance, that is the dispersion of the other, uh, of the other arguments there. Okay, so the uh, MJ will be, uh, um, is, in, is the inverse, the, the sigma square is the inverse of the number of of, of, uh, of currencies. You have MJ, the number of currencies in the zone, and it's to the minus one or to the minus phi. That means that we have an inverse relation. The, the, the lower the amount of the, the number of, of currencies, the higher the other costs and vice versa. <clears throat> and then uh, what we do is we compare uh, what the dispersion is in Europe with the dispersion in America, in the United States. And here, so we set some numbers, this is, uh, the, uh, um, the unemployment, the dispersion of unemployment, the rate of unemployment should be equal or less than Z, and Z is the unemployment in, in the States, and the same with W and so on. Now, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me get on to the graphical results. <clears throat> we, have, uh, we have set for the inflation variance among the different states in the United States, is the blue line at the bottom. And the inflation variance in Europe, um, it's sort of dizzy, 
goes like that. And so this simply tells us, I don't know what we're going to do about inflation rates or whatever. I'm not interested today in politics or policy. They simply say it's very difficult for the European Union to be an, an optimal currency zone compared to one which has been working for some time, and that's the dollar zone. With all its defects, it has a single currency. So this is inflation variance. Um, do I have a pointer? Yes. Oh, good. Look at this. What? Despite of if you eliminate the peak. Yeah, it's, it's, it's higher. It's, oh, sorry. It's around... Yeah, it's, a, it's, around, uh, it's around four, more or less, if you take the peak of well, a bit, four and a half. But this, it's not so much the level, it's the variance, which makes different countries in different yeah, parts. It's on the, on the yes, it's inflation there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is the variance of the inflation, and, and this, this is the year. Let's go to the next one. GDP growth. Well, this looks a little more uh, the same in both places, though the euro has a, a greater variance as we... The euro has a greater variance, but still. Then changes in the real exchange rate, which is uh, if you are in Greece and you have an inflation of, I don't know, 7%, the euro, the real euro, is worth less than in Germany where the inflation is 2%. Right? So this is a way of looking at the variance of the real exchange rate. And again here, we have, we have the, yeah, the euro real exchange rate. The, the, average, the average is, again, moving much more while inf the inflation rates in the states are much more equal. This is all the conditions for uh, having a, a nearly an optimal currency zone, and we're showing that the, uh, the eurozone is not that. And unemployment variance, um, the unemployment variance is, again, my finger, this is the fat finger <laughs> <laughs> syndrome. I press and I press one million instead of a hundred thousand. Okay. So, Oh dear, let me see where we are. Uh, unemployment. The unemployment variance is again much higher in, in the Eurozone. While you have an unemployment from the US, but you don't have the variety among states. Okay. All right. Now, the next one labor costs, the change in labor costs. Uh, unfortunately, the data for U the US. Uh, are incomplete in a way because the, the U.S. has labor costs before uh, in, in Federal Reserve zones <coughs> rather than by states. But here you are again. You have again you have this variance, and then government deficit. The same thing. Uh, of course, the end is, is bad, but it, it's the variance is higher, it's nearly double there, and then. Uh, those are the data that we have. And we can, in future, extend the model. We want to extend the model to find an index of dispersion um, by having a weighted average to say, well, the index of dispersion in the, in the uh, European Union is bigger or double or treble what you have in the US. <clears throat> and we want to extend this historically and geographically too. So what we've brought here is uh, the beginning of a mammoth work afraid. All right. Okay. So um, what, what have we done up to now? What we've said is if, uh, if we want or if the people creating the euro want the euro to be easy to manage because Europe is a single monetary or an optimal monetary zone, uh, that makes it easier. That can be done by changing the institutional structure so that there's not so much variance uh, among the countries. But on the other hand, uh, in the United States, we compare it with the United States, and there, the dollar within the United States works, because uh, there isn't such a dispersion of the results as among states. With us, it isn't so. Uh, well, then we'll see what we want to do in life with uh, the euro and other things. But what we've pointed at is the dispersion, and then we want to have a number and say, if you want in the East, uh, as they're doing in East Asia, 
you want to have a single monetary zone and perhaps are talking about a single currency. And if in uh, Latin America you have uh, Brazil and Paraguay and Argentina and Chile trying to have some sort of single currency, then it would be good if you had that number to tell you how difficult it's going to be. And with this uh, reflection about facts and not about what we wish, and I'm sure that we wish the same as uh, Jesus was explaining, we have to know what the obstacles are to having a single currency in an optimal currency zone. Thank you very much.